How do con men inspire author Susan Swan? We're going to find out today on today's episode of All About Canadian Books. But before we do, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel so you can keep up to date with the latest author interviews and behind the book stories. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to All About Canadian Books. And I am thrilled to have author Susan Swan as a guest this week. Now, Susan is a journalist, feminist, novelist, activist, teacher, and a gardener. And Susan's critically acclaimed novels have been published in 20 countries. And we'll be talking about her eighth novel, can you see that there? The Dead Celebrities Club, which was published by Cormorant Books. So get comfy. We've got a little greed, fraud, and financial fallout today. And here's what the Dead Celebrities Club is about. Dale Paul is the hedge fund whale. He enjoys a life of self-delusion that allows him to gamble other people's money. But when he gambles the pensions of the American military and fails, Dale Paul goes to prison, where he is confronted with the challenge of understanding himself and his place in the age of the new robber barons. Welcome to All About Books, Susan. Thank you, Crystal. It's a pleasure to be here. So... Susan, I really like on your website how you describe yourself. You say you are a novelist and a nonfiction writer whose personal obsessions inform you what to write about. And your current obsession is con men and whether they can change. So my question for you is two parts. The first part, how did this obsession start with con men? Well, it really started with Conrad Black going to prison. Um, I knew Conrad very sort of um, minimally when I was a teenager. He was friends with a group of boys that my brother hang, hung out with, a group of wealthy Toronto Wasp boys. And he was the nerd in the group, the one that used big words and could talk philosophically and was interested in political issues and was in fact an intellectual, uh, whereas most of the boys in that group were athletes and, and um, fun-loving party types. They, were, they weren't like Conrad, he, he stood out. And when I saw that he'd been convicted, I wondered what it was going to be like for him in jail. I wondered, will it have an impact on him? Will he, start to understand that the world he grew up in and moves in is, is just a small part of the world really and not how most people live. So I was fascinated with his journey, if you will, and I uh, wondered if he would be able to change. Mm -hmm. So I began to research him quite intensely and think about a character based on him who in my book is named Dale Paul. Okay. and it was a very uh, sort of slow start to the book because at first I, I, I was quite judgmental about this Dale Paul character. And I was writing in third person and I kind of wanted to punish him, um, but it made for very didactic prose. It made for a story that really didn't have any energy because it was just about a writer taking out their irritation and anger on a character uh, instead of presenting the character to the reader in a way that the reader could get involved with him. So that is a short-ish answer, but there's a lot more there. I, did, I ran into Conrad um, at a literary event a few years ago. And I mean, he's still very charming and he's very smart. And apparently uh, my publisher sent him the novel and um, he read it and said there was one problem with it, that if it's based on him, he didn't do anything wrong. He was sent to prison unfairly. So that tells you in a nutshell, 
that it didn't really change him. <clears throat> uh, although I noticed when he came out of, of jail, he was more, uh, he used to talk about the need for prison reform and that the United States system was warehousing basically poor, poor men and that this was unfair. So he did have an experience in the US jail that showed him how the other half lives in the United States. Mm -hmm. And he was very sympathetic to them. He, for instance, he helped a lot of them get their high school certificate. Mm -hmm. And when he left, I, I believe there was a lot of gratitude, a lot of men lined up to thank him and say goodbye. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we aren't all black and white. Um, no. And of course, the novelist's job is to to convey the ambiguities of your characters and and make them human. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Susan, what about Dale Paul? Do you think Dale Paul can change a, a little bit like Conrad? Or <laughs> I think in my novel, I wrestled with this a lot, and I was amazed at how cynical. I was about this, I, I thought, oh, he'll never change. And um, I talked to some psychologists who worked in prisons and they told me, you're wrong. Actually, people change in prison all the time. You know, there, this one uh, psychologist explained that there were quite a number of different types of personalities that she had watched go through the system and, and change. One would be, um, a young man who ages in the prison and gets tired of having to be the young Turk and go through this life of crime. Um, he sees the young the young men coming coming up, and he just gets weary of it. He doesn't want it. And then there's another type which Dale Paul fits, and probably Conrad fits too, which is the the, the thrill seeker. Um, you know that. I had this theory that Dale Paul, like Conrad, and probably like Trump too, would take on things that they knew had a big chance that they would lose, that they would lose at. But the excitement and the risk involved was just too thrilling and too um, enticing. And uh, this kind of personality, the psychologist explained to me, Sometimes these men learn to transfer that hunger for excitement and risk into something like mountain climbing instead of, in, instead of putting it into yeah. crime, right? So <clears throat> I thought that there was a very good chance uh, that Dale Paul could change. He goes through a harrowing experience in the book yes. where he, you know, he's close to death and he, um, he would try to change anyway, I thought. He would, he would attempt a new life, always worried that he might go back to the old ways, which is the risk taker and, you know, and not, not being straight. Uh, I think that it's very hard to change and to do something so dramatic like uh, Dale Paul would have to do sort of involves the same commitment that an artist or a writer makes to their work. You know, you'd have to really persist in it and um, support yourself in various ways in your new life. I mean, it wouldn't be easy. So mm -hmm. I, I've thought at the end that he was, I guess I, I shouldn't give too much away, perhaps if people are going to read the book, but speaking to you, Crystal, I can tell you that he, I think there was a potential for change in him. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd have to say, Susan, you know, as a reader, it, it, it was very fun to get a glimpse of, of this world that is just so unfamiliar. And also to ride along with Dale Paul in this self delusional world that he navigates. And as a writer, it must have been so much fun for you to create this world for Dale Paul. And I was wondering, while you were writing, Susan, 
Was there ever a time when Dale Paul took over and took you to a place that even you were surprised about? Yes, he he was uh, an interesting character because, of course, everything, a lot of his belief system was so different from mine. <laughs> so I I didn't really know what he was going to do exactly. Um, I guess his treatment of his friend, Tim Nugent, who's writing his biography yeah. was, uh, that took me somewhere I didn't expect to go because I saw more clearly how the class difference worked between someone like Tim who came from a professional family and someone like Dale Paul who came from basically a mercantile family that was wealthy. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was a nice bonus. I think Dale Paul's delusional thinking, and he, he did have some of that, was easy in a sense. It's just giving you over, giving yourself over to what you want to believe is true, what you feel is true, even if it's, even if it's not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we could see with Trump that a lot of the things he would say and do, I, I suspect he believed them very much at the moment, but then he would know that they're not true. And this is the kind of characteristic of our age right at the moment where we equate facts with feelings. If I feel it's true, it, it must be true. Mm -hmm. So in a way, Dale Paul, despite his eccentricities was very representative of what, what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And also as a reader, Susan, another element of your novel, which I really appreciated was, not only did you take us into Dale Paul's world, you also took us into the world of all the people that were in that orbit with him, because his mm -hmm. actions had repercussions on everyone, you know, whether it be the vets, his ex-wife, his son, everyone. And when you first started structuring the novel, was your intention to pull so many people into that narrative as well? Or did that kind of happen organically as you were writing the novel? It happened organically that I began to layer in um, these other lives and how they felt about Dale Paul. Mm -hmm. Because staying nonstop with Dale Paul and his sense of entitlement gets to be pretty intense and yeah. I wanted a break from that too so it would give me a pause as the as the author yeah. to just um, let the narrative breathe a bit so we don't have this constant me 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 thing uh, that Dale Paul is for most of the book involved in and I had also an interesting experience doing the research for the book I became friends with a man called Charlie Shrem who was put in jail in the US for fraud. And he, um, he was a nice young man from Long Island and he had been involved as, in Bitcoin, the start of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so he would um, email me from prison what it was like to be in prison. And that's when I found out things like, you know, the man would be, there was no air conditioning, so the men would cover themselves in baby powder in the summer and that sort of thing. Right. And uh, he, he is an interesting story, too, in, in that he told me he wasn't guilty of what he had been put in jail for. It was kind of a mistake. And he, he was released after a couple of years. And I read about him. I lost touch with him. He didn't answer me. Mm -hmm. uh, I read about him in, online and he was back in jail and he had done some scams to do with oh. Bitcoin. And the way they found out was uh, because he started, the FBI was watching him. He started having, buying expensive yachts and living a kind of very grand and expensive lifestyle. And so they um, investigated and found out, yes, he was, he was doing fraud. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, in answer to your question, the other lives around somebody that is a fraudster, they're profoundly affected by it. I imagine Charlie Schrem's family were incredibly disappointed when he was back in prison. He was a very personable and likable young man, and I felt bad when I heard about it. So there's this sympathy that exists 
for for the devil, I guess, if you like, <laughs> quote a Rolling Stone song, uh, and and their actions profoundly um, alter people's mm -hmm. experience. And you know, his sister in the novel, well, his cousin who considers herself like his sister, he had a huge impact on her life, mm -hmm. and. And that's what happens. Sometimes you could almost say that the people around a fraudster are as interesting as the fraudster yes. because they they reflect all these things that he does and says and mm -hmm. and um, have their experience changed just by knowing him. Yeah, I won't give anything away, but I was totally rooting for Meredith Paul. Like I just wanted her to. It's like oh. Yeah. Yeah. Meredith is a very lovable character because she believes, uh, for people who haven't read the book, his cousin, sister, his kister, he calls her, she yeah. believes that he can change. Yes. She, she hopes for that and she keeps believing in that and gets um, rebuffed quite a bit. And But she loves him. She grew up yeah. with him. She loves him. And I, and that's I certainly appreciated that because that's such a human quality is we want the people we love to be successful and worthy. <laughs> we don't we don't want them to disappoint us, <laughs> shall we say? That's absolutely true. You know, we want them to be their best selves for the world. Yes. 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 Um, the other part that I was really fascinated, of course, we've got the dead celebrities club i had no idea that there was such a thing as the celebrities dead pool mm -hmm. so how did you come across this was this just something that you stumbled upon before you started the book or while you were doing your research well that's a really good question because it there's an interesting story with that <laughs> my brother um belongs to or belong, they've closed it now. He belonged to a Deadpool. And every month they would meet at the local bar and mm -hmm. bet on which celebrity would be the next to die. Mm -hmm. And how it worked was, um, it was men and women. They would be gathered in this bar. And at the start of the year, one of them would put together a list of celebrities that were either frail mm -hmm. or, um, um, old or diseased, you had to be in the news and about to die. That's how you qualified to get on this this Deadpool. Yeah. And my brother, <clears throat> I think, won four hundred dollars betting on Idea Amin, and that the um, the uh, whole setup just fascinated me. Like here are these local men, none of them famous, mm -hmm. um, local men and women none of them particularly rich or successful mm -hmm. betting on people who had been either rich or very successful in their careers and and in a way uh, hoping for their death and that's kind of uh, morbid right it, yes but, <laughs> but it didn't have that feeling it had a sort of hilarity to it it was like the celebrities were not really viewed as people and in a way they are kind of a currency you know if you're going to do a demonstration the organizers will say well who, you know who can we get that's a celebrity to come and endorse our cause yeah. they're, they're kind of a yeah they're a currency mm -hmm. and and there is the tendency in the media also to treat them as as objects not not as people Mm -hmm. We've just uh, seen that recently with the Meghan and Harry yeah. <laughs> interview with Oprah about their lives as part of the royal family. Mm -hmm. There's this uh, fascination, and yet it it's a bit um, dehumanizing, I think. And and uh, so I interviewed my brother and his friends, and they gave me the charts of the celebrities and told me their method, and and that you know that's really how the book started. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing. And Susan, what are you currently working on? I'm currently writing a memoir called Bigger. And mm -hmm. it's about how size has shaped my life. Because I'm 6'2". And oh. I was 6'2 at 12. Oh my and goodness. So, so a lot of my um, 
early life was about trying to figure out how to cope with this big body that I, I was given to given. And I, I've um, divided the book up into four sections where I go and do things that are quests really looking for a place where I fit. My first novel was about a giantess, Anna Swan, who exhibited with P.T. Barnum. And she spent her life, her very short life, as giants die young, they're sort of worn out by gravity. She died at 44, but she spent her short life looking um, for places and environments to live that would suit her. And she went to New York and exhibited mm -hmm. with P.T. Barnum and his American Museum. She went to London, England, or she met Queen Victoria and married the Kentucky giant. She went on the continent um, because back in the 1860s, if you were oversized or undersized, you were a, you were a kind of celebrity actually. And, and Barnum promoted that. He made mm -hmm. sort of sleazy entertainment out of it, but at the same time he treated them like show business professionals and they were really well paid. Mm -hmm. And Anna who was born in Nova Scotia ended up in Seville, Ohio with her giant husband who was seven two, she was seven foot six. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and uh, they had their second baby there who died and it was 24 pounds at birth and they lived in a giant farmhouse. Oh. Anyway, her quest to find a place that fit never really worked out mm -hmm. because every environment would have its problems. And in their final home in Seville, the uh, local folk saw them as rich show business people and didn't really like them very much. Mm -hmm. And I, I, in my memoir, I talk about Anne a lot and also how my life has been um, looking for environments that are suitable for me. Mm -hmm. And I am not, uh, I guess I, I much luckier than Anna was because I'm not a show business giant. I didn't grow that tall, although I thought I might at six two, at 12. Um, and I was able to actually understand that it wasn't about finding a place that fit. It was about me making uh, a construct of my life where I felt comfortable. I didn't have to go somewhere else to, to um, discover the, the environment, the right environment. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Wow. <laughs> and I imagine a book with that type of messaging. I mean, everyone might not be six two, but we can just trying to find our place in the world. That's um, right. Yeah. And our, our, how we are physically yeah. um, shapes our lives. It, it really does. Oh, well, I'll look forward to that when that comes out in the world. Thank you, Crystal. And Susan, thank you so much for being a guest this week on All About Canadian Books. I so enjoyed your stories and getting to know you. For everyone who's watching, there will be links down below to uh, Susan's website so you can learn even more about Susan, but also to purchase copies of her, of, of her catalog of books. So thank you, Susan. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Crystal. It was terrific.